it's kind of controversial. Early research tended to emphasize more the special nature of language, whereas more recent work has emphasized perhaps more the the con continuum, the extent to which language is just building on non-linguistic, more general purpose cognitive mechanisms. The extreme case, of course, is Noam Chomsky, who hypothesized that there's a built-in special and evolutionarily encoded kind of universal language that all of us have. And ultimately, uh, that idea was based on, you know, an idea that you couldn't really learn language without having such a thing. But in fact, we now know that by relying on statistics, probabilities of word occurrence, and much more kind of generative, constructive uh, learning mechanisms, it's much more likely that we don't need to have some kind of innate language, innate grammar to be able to learn language. There's a lot of uh, uh, structure in what we hear, even though there are also lots of errors. Uh, everything I'm saying is probably not perfectly well formed, um, especially if you listen to real speech. It, it often deviates from official kind of grammar, uh, and that's part of the whole notion of the poverty of the stimulus, how language is challenging to learn because we don't get perfect examples. But if you kind of blur your eyes and integrate over all the different examples, there's a lot of regularity and structure there that our brains can kind of soak up. And so this notion of kind of rules and regularities in language has been a real focus. And one of the areas in which, you know, we, we have seen debates between people looking at neural network models versus more abstract uh, symbolic models and trying to understand, is there something special about that kind of rule-like properties of language versus what you would get from a sort of typical neural network that's kind of learning to map from one pattern of activity in one layer to another pattern of activity in another layer. Um, it turns out that, you know, neural networks do like to have kind of systematic mappings, which kind of look like a rule, but there may be something more explicit, more consciously accessible, and more susceptible to kind of introspection and manipulation in a sort of metacognitive way about some of the rules that we have in language. Not all of them, for sure. And a lot of people, if you ask them, don't really know, you know, explicitly the rules of language. They just kind of have them and can use them. But on the other hand, if you ask people like, you know, what do you do when you have a past tense? Uh, most people could probably tell you that, yeah, you sort of add an ED, right? Um, so you have some level of accessibility. And so this kind of nature, what what is going on? Was it do we have some kind of special neural systems that do these kind of rules? Or is it just, you know, regular, regular networks of neurons? These are the kinds of deep questions that language research has really explored over the years. Um, and I think we don't really actually have the full story on that at this point. It's actually become a more recently a much more active area of research again. And the current generation of large scale you know, very powerful AI models actually still suffer from limits in their kind of generativity and systematicity uh, in, in these kinds of rule-like domains that, you know, were the subject of these debates uh, back in the 80s and 90s. And so it's kind of deja vu all over again in terms of people who've been in the field for a long time. Uh, these same, same kinds of issues are coming back up. And I think we really don't yet have a synthesis that allows us to understand kind of both of those perspectives, the kind of more symbolic, explicit rule-like kind of properties um, in, integrated with our understanding of the underlying neural mechanisms, which you know we know a lot more about, as you can see from this class. How do we get a picture that kind of integrates those two things? So when we talk about systematicity, um, we inevitably, uh, talk about this kind of open-ended generative nature of language. And, you know, here's a sentence, structure, adjective, adjective, noun, verb, adverb. Uh, that's uh, a very abstract description of the following famous example sentence. Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. This was, I think, due to Chomsky. Um, and, uh, and it was introduced as an example of something that is essentially purely syntactic, something that has no semantic meaning whatsoever, essentially like a word salad. Um, 
and uh, and yet we can understand it. We can say that's a valid sentence. We can verify that it's syntactically correct, even though it has no meaning whatsoever. And so this is a demonstration of the idea that we do have some kind of pure rule-like syntactic ability that can be applied to any combination of words. On the other hand, when you actually process this sentence, you're inevitably kind of representing some kind of semantic interpretation. And the, the big question is, to what extent is that automatic semantic kind of encoding actually contributing to your overall ability to judge the validity of that sentence? And certainly there are, in addition to kind of syntactic effects, there are certainly semantic effects. People are faster and more accurate to, to judge sentences as being uh, correct if they also make sense semantically. And so, yes, there's an ability at some level to represent things abstractly, but how far does it really stray from our more concrete semantic kind of, you know, concrete understanding of the world? And so this, this sentence here may be understood in terms of newly formed colorless, uh, I mean, green is, is newly formed, bland is colorless, ideas are inexpressible in an infuriating way. And so sleep furiously is kind of like they're churning away in our minds. Uh, there's actually quite a, a nice poetic uh, sense of this little sentence here. Um, and people have uh, really elaborated this uh, in, in this example here. Um, and, you know, there's also these kind of crazy uh, non-word constructions. Twas brillig and the slithy toves, whatever the hell that means. Um, and so famous examples from Lewis Carroll. Um, but, you know, there's some kind of overlap there. There's some kind of brilliant brillig, slithy is kind of slimy. You know, these things kind of have uh, overlap in a distributed representation sense. And maybe that's important for how we actually process those things. So again, a lot of interesting questions about these dividing lines between kind of pure structural syntactic understanding versus kind of semantic knowledge. Here's a little bit more about uh, this important point about uh, time and language. Uh, these kind of wordos are increasingly popular and kind of a nice way of representing a concept as a kind of distributed representation. I think they're one of the reasons they're so appealing is they're kind of a, a nice encapsulation of what it feels like to have a distributed representation in your brain. All these different words that all kind of overlap with each other, all kind of superimposed together. This kind of gives you a, a, a rough, global, distributed, gestalty type of feeling about what the concept of, you know, beach and summer and all these other kinds of things. But it doesn't really make a specific point, right? And so to make a specific point, that's again this kind of need for binding which then requires that sequential kind of structured organization of the knowledge to say here's the relationships among different things that i'm actually communicating not just sort of like blur 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 you know some kind of big blob of distributed activity that doesn't really uh, have a specific point or structure there's another kind of very compelling example of the distributed nature of our word representations, which can metaphorically be extended to these kind of larger distributed representations of semantic knowledge. Uh, you may have received this in the email, maybe not, maybe you're too young. Uh, this went around a while back, but maybe you've seen it before. Uh, it's quite amazing. You can start reading this and it's like, wait a second, I can actually understand what I'm reading. Uh, and what you see here is that the first and last letter are very important, but you can kind of jumble up the order of the letters in the inside of words. And if you have the right kind of context, especially, um, it's actually pretty easy to uh, read these words. And that tells us that uh, although kind of order information and structure is important, it's not, you know, essential, right? So there's a lot that we can understand just in terms of this kind of parallel activation uh, in this case of all the individual letters, but it could be more general in terms of concepts. And so a lot of neural network models that uh, uh, we use in language actually have this notion of a bag of words. Um, and again, if you're gonna do it at the letter level, at the word level, you would talk about a bag of letters. 
um, this kind of unordered collection of items and and that's this notion of kind of the overall unstructured distributed representation um, and uh, and so those kinds of representations actually are particularly powerful and we'll get into some of those issues when we think about how uh, word pronunciation works in the context of uh, reading and pronouncing a word and we can go back to lessons we learned from our object recognition model to understand the how letters are organized and represented inside words.